Okay, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'll share my screen. And as Rachel just announced, uh, starting next week, uh, we're starting, this is the last of the series. In case you didn't catch on, the last three weeks have been basically Parsha Shavua, And each week has been a topic that relates both to Parsha Shavua in Israel and in Chutz Laretz. And it's um, what was about the sin, um, the people complaining in Parsha Balota, the spies complain, the spies sinning in Parsha Shlach, and this week Korach and Chukas with the uh, Moshe Aaron. But basically, the topic is the failure of the first generation, and what we can learn from the stories we're reading the last couple of weeks. We had a little couple of insights. So today is going to be the last topic, and the famous topic of the sin of Moshe in the rock. Or I'll just read my introduction. I think we're okay. Um, so we're all familiar with the famous story of Moshe and the rock and its tragic punishment and that he couldn't enter Israel. Today, sure, we're going to re-examine the details of the event in light of what we've studied so far. Not in Sefer Dvarim, that should be Sefer Rabbi Bar. That's the typo there. That should be Sefer Dvarim. Actually, Dvarim also, but Bamid Bar. Um, better understand God's harsh decision. Okay, so let's start like this. Um, I want to ask a couple of questions and feel free to participate either in the either uh, locally or in the chat. Okay, um, let me play a little game. Um, if someone asks you what was Moshe's famous sin, what's the classic? Not not every one of the people know the, like the details, but what what's the average Jew on the street say? What was Moshe's big sin? Does someone say the right answer, the right wrong answer? Hitting the rock instead of speaking to me. Exactly. Okay, I was gonna play with Susanna today. Okay, and Susanna, does everyone agree? Give a thumbs up if you agree, with Susanna. What was his punishment? They didn't get to go into Paris Israel. So, okay. And what's everyone's gut reaction the first time they hear that story? It's unfair. Okay, and what did they teach you when you were in school? I don't remember. Oh, come on. So someone fill in. What, even though, do you think it's unfair? Why is it really fair? Someone give the classic answer? He should have listened. No, why, why is Moshe punished for such a small little transaction? Be, be, because Cause. he's on a very high level. He's on exactly. a very high the high, level. The bigger you are, like it, God holds you to a higher yeah. level. That's ask nine nine out of ten people, if not ninety nine out of hundred people. That's Hashem, what they'll tell you. Hashem set them up. Go ahead. The problem with that explanation is that other than Rashi, which is Rashi, you know, was worth his weight for sure. Uh, but other than Rashi, all the classic Parshanim totally disagree that Moshe was not wrong by hitting the rock. Ramban and Ben Ezra, Rambam, um, and Rabbeinu, uh, uh, Rabbeinu Hanana, almost every classic Parshan, other than Rashi. Of course, Rashi is putting Chazal, disagree and hold. It was Moshe's sin was not hitting the rock. Um, so today we're going to understand primarily what the reason for the Machloket. But the main goal we're going to talk about is that theme of leadership in Sefer Devarim and what's going on. Uh, basically, what causes the failure of the first generation? And as long as we're talking about political events, um, who takes responsibility for a failure? Follow? Bottom line, the first generation was a failure. So again, remember the three sections? You can blame the people. You can blame the leaders, and you can blame God. You can blame, I mean, ever since Ghanadin, we always blame somebody else. Remember, ever since the first story of man in Ghanadin, man sins, and he blames his wife, he blames God. Um, and uh, the question is, do you take responsibility when you do something wrong? And it's not one person who's, who's to blame. It, usually it's a combination. So what I'm trying to show you in this series is that there's definitely blame on behalf of the people. There's definitely blame on behalf of, of the, the tribal leaders. And then we talk about Moshe and Aaron. Now, there's no doubt Moshe and Aaron are the leaders of the generation, and that generation fails. So who's to blame? You can do nothing wrong, but you're still, you're in charge. And bottom line, Moshe and Aaron as the leaders of the generation went out of Egypt, didn't succeed. Again, who to blame? You can argue left and right. But bottom line, they're the leaders, and at least they have administrative responsibility. Okay. Um, okay. As far as iPads come out, about Moshe living too long, we'll get to that very soon. Because I want to ask two more questions now, um, not the classic questions. Think for a minute. Um, the story of Moshe and the Rock. When did it happen? In what year? The last year. It, it could be year forty. Any other possibility? Second year. Okay. Most people think it's year forty because they read Rashi, and Rashi on the first passage of chapter twenty in Parshat Chukat. What's he say? Miriam died in year 40. Because the, we, first we talk about Miriam's death in chapter. We'll get to that later on. 
But everyone assumes the Parsha Chukas is year 40. The problem is it never says that anywhere in Chumash. Right that? Now, there's no doubt that Aaron dies in the 40th year. And Aaron dies in chapter in chapter 20. 20. Aaron dies in Parsha Chukas. There's, there's no doubt Parsha Chukat includes the 40th year, events of the 40th year. In fact, the story of the spies, we read this last week in Parsha Shlach, that happened in year two. That's for sure. How many stories are there in, in Chumash between the story of the spies and Moshe in the rock? Want to take a wild guess? How many I'm, narratives are there? None. There's one, <laughs> which is the story of Korach. Now, when did the story of Korach happen? We have no idea. It doesn't say anywhere when Korach happened. We don't know where it happened. It doesn't say when it happened, it doesn't say where it happened. It's a great machloket. Eben Ezra claims it happened before we left our Sinai. The Korach, I mean, Eben Ezra has no problem taking Chumash out of order. He says before we left our Sinai, it happened. In year, in year one, in year two, when, when they were dividing up the, uh, the different jobs of Levim. It makes a lot of sense what he's saying. Of course, Ramban will disagree. But when does it happen? Soon after the sin of the spies? In year two, in year three, in year four? Or in year 40? Or in year 30? Then say, does it? Now, how do you, how to understand Korach's rebellion, right? It makes a lot of difference. Is it the first generation rebelling or the, or the new generation rebelling? Now, motion in the rock. If motion in the rock is happening in year 40, which is the classic explanation, that's really sad, isn't it? 40 years, Moshe's holding on the last minute. That's it. He loses it. Now, I think I've had mentioned before that Moshe's too old, already 120. The question is going to be, is when Moshe prayed to God, which we talked about last week, not to kill the nation at once, because it'll be a chilo Hashem. And God said, Salati ki Okay, remember, Moshe doesn't dive and let them go to Israel because he agrees with God. They're not ready. But once God said, once God agrees not to kill them all at once, let them die a natural death in the desert, <laughs> then basically Moshe sealed his own fate. And to save the people from dying all at once and causing a chil Hashem, waiting, once we wait for a new generation to bring them in, it's already, it's, there's no way Moshe can leave. We'll consider that possibility later on. But a question to think about, again, we're not going to solve the question, but it's important to think about, is Moshe in the rock, when Moshe, you know, Kiss the punishment, not to go to Israel. Is it at the last minute, at the 40th year, or is it soon after the sin of the spies? Uh, just to give to sh show you, a Barbanel claims, a Barbanel claims, based in his commentary in Sefer Devarim, Mishnah Moshe's speech in Sefer Devarim, chapter one, that God's decision that Moshe isn't going in happened right after the sin of the spies and because of the sin of the spies. And that's something we have to entertain, and we'll try to understand where a Barbanel is coming from. We're not going to agree with that, a Barbanel. But we're going to entertain that possibility. But the fact he brings up that possibility shows it's unclear when that decision was made. The motion is not going in. Okay. Now, one last question, and we get to work. Um, everyone knows Moshe did something wrong because he got punished. Was Moshe Shin Shogeg or Mezid? Whatever he did wrong. Let's say, let's say he hit the rock instead of talking to it. And let's take the classic explanation. Do you ever think about that? Did Moshe know it was wrong? He did it anyhow. Or do most of think he was doing the right thing? You ever think about that for a minute? With, with, just for the fun of it, we'll play with the chat. Just write whether you thought, just think for a minute what you think. Most, assuming Moshe hit the rock instead of talking to him, assuming that was a sin, okay? okay. Was Moshe sin shogeger mezid? means he knew it was wrong, he did it anyhow, or he thought he was doing the right thing, he misunderstood something. There's a third possibility, and that's that God put him up to it by telling him to take his staff. And he hit the first time around. So so, it, it, it's, it's less than Shogeg. I mean, he was, I mean, he thought he was doing the right thing. I mean, he never yeah. realized he did something wrong. Uh, and, you know, we're we're going to get to that story there. Maybe like breaking the tablets. Yeah, I mean, Moshe's made a lot of decisions on his own and God gives him the Shikoff sometimes. So it's interesting whether Moshe does it. But now, if Moshe was Shogeg, then the question of his punishment becomes even more harsh, right? I understand if Moshe was, did something wrong, amazing. Okay, his punishment. Maybe a small infraction, but yeah. But if he thought he was doing the right thing and it was Shogeg, then the question on God is even stronger. 
So we're gonna re we're gonna start the story from scratch, and um, and try to understand better what's going on because it doesn't make sense that for some small infraction, the Moshe loses you know, can't go to Israel. But it's Israel not, after it, all the, after all that hard work. It's not a small okay. infraction. He's belittling God. When he says, Hamin hasela hazen, no tzi lachem mayim, who is no tzi? It should be, okay. will God bring forth water? And when he says to Bnei Israel, he's belittling them, shimunah hamorim, he's already belittling them as the rebellious ones. Okay, so we're, we're going to see where all that's coming from. We're going to take what Lynn just said and see where it's coming from. But even, that's Rabbi Nuchananel. Some of Rabbi Nuchananel, some is the Rambam. But Ibn Ezra, like classic Parshanim, totally disagree. And they're, they have a really good... You know, they have a really good point, which we'll see. So here's what we're going to do. Um, what we're going to do is we're simply going to go back to the crime scene and study the psukim from scratch. So let's take a look. I'll share my screen now. And we're going to read. Uh, where are we? Let's go quick review. Go to the crime scene. And we have the question is, so you may see it in one. Okay, now. Let's look at Pasachet. By Dabra Hashem Moshe Lemor, God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, here's the source. And my computer is very slow today for some reason. Here we are. Okay. Look at Pasachet. I want everyone to look at Pasachet. It's on my screen. I'm going to highlight it. Okay. What I want everyone to do. Okay, is it highlighted? Yeah, okay. Tachet and tells, take this, take the staff, gather the nation together, together with our own, speak to the rock, and it will give water. Um, and take water out of the rock. Mishkita. Okay, just look at that Pasach, Hebrew, English. What I want you to do is I want you to count how many commands is Moshe given? Just, you'll see why the question is important later on. Just count how many commandments Moshe Rabbeinu was given. One of them is to the rock. It's to speak to the rock, I'm sorry. Uh, but there's more than more than one commandment. Count them up. And pay attention to how many commandments Moshe is given. And just give me a number. Six. Okay, so just write, write, you can say, say out loud or write in the chat. And we'll see, so far I got one six. Five. We got five, okay. No, I said six. Okay, six. Okay, I, I want, I'm, I'm, I'm keep, keeping track. Six. I want to hear as many answers as possible. Six. Okay, another six. Seems like it's an option. So far, I got one five. 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 Another five. Two fives and two sixes. Five. Six. Another six. Okay. You can write in the chat. Also, feel free to write the chat. Five. I see. Another five. So we're half. We're three fives and three sixes. This is seven. We got that. We got a seven. Okay. Anybody with a four, maybe? It's Sunday golf day. We can. Uh, I remember from golf, there's a four iron and a five and six and a seven. Okay. So I got, I got some five sixes and sevens. So let's take a look. Okay. Command number one is kachatamate. Agree. Take the staff. That's a command, isn't it? That's imperative. Okay. Hakela teida, gather the nation together with Taylor with Aaron. Okay. Uh, speak to the rock, and it will give water. And botzete lemay minasela, take water out of the rock. Bishkita teida bet biram and give them. Thing. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna claim there's five, and I'll try to explain why. Let's look at the five commands. Oops, sorry about that. Jump ahead. Okay. Here, here are the five commands. Got him? Take the staff. Okay. Gather the nation. Speak to the rock. It'll give water. And take water out of the rock and give them to drink. Okay. If you were Moshe Rabbeinu, what would you do for each for each of these commands? Has he ever done that before? Yes. He's a pro, isn't he? Ten plagues, splitting the sea. Moshe, is there anything he hasn't done with his matet? With taking his matet, that's that's a uh, that's a classic. Already, gathering the nation together with Aaron. Has he ever done that before? Yeah. Uh, piece of cake. So far, the first two were easy. Now, what would you do for three? Uh, by the way, who kind of an atan mimav is a command? But those of you who said six probably counted counted that as a command. Because you commanded, you counted yeah. verbs and not command, if I'm not mistaken. But that's what I want to catch you on. But a tamimab is not a command. 
The command to Moshe is speak to the rock. Yeah. It's, it's a future tense, not a command. That's right. It says speak to the rock in front of them and the rock will give water. But the commandment is to speak to the rock. Okay? And if you speak to the rock, it'll give water. Now, if you were Moshe, what would you do? What would you say to the rock? Any idea? Speak to the rock. What, what would you say to the rock? Hotsimai. Give water. Would you say, Tzuri Yisrael something like that? If you were a Zionist? I, I tell you, this is my favorite joke. I'm sorry, wait a second. I just ruined something. Let's share my screen again. Uh, I have a claim that Moshe should say the following. Let me play with my annotate. And if you get this right, one second. I need to use my no text. There we go. I can do text. So I'm going to put text right here. You should say, how's this? Anyone get that? Apple Kadabra? That was just a little joke for uh, my teach 18 year olds. But so, by the way, <laughs> Apple Kadabra is Aramaic, isn't it? From Briat Olam. Avra Kadabra, create as I speak. But so, Akra Kadabra would be a good one for, uh, for Moshe. But that was just a joke. Now, um, again, what should he say? Totally unclear, agreed? But he should say something, Rock. And after speaking to Rock, what should happen? The Rock should give water. Now, what should he do for command number five? If that was command number three, what should he do? Oh, I'm sorry, I just lost that. Um, control Z, okay. What should he do now for command number four? Okay, get rid of that. Second. Um, get the water out of the rock. Uh, how about gravity? Isn't water coming out of the rock in, in command number three? If God says, speak to the rock, it'll give water. What is he supposed to do for four? Listen, when I ask the question, how many commands, many people say there's four commands, and they don't count, they don't count command number four. No, because it, it's, he did not do it. No, he didn't do it, but how, did, Maybe how would you understand the, logistics. the command? Maybe there's nothing for him to do, is there? Some English translations say, thus you have taken water out of the rock. It's very difficult to translate four because if three is a command, speak to the rock will give water, then four seems to be like a summary of the command. But four is a command. I want to make sure it's crystal clear because this is key for this year. If command number three is to speak to the rock, it, it will give water, then I don't need command number four. Right. Command number five is allow them to drink. It's so number five, you have two. So number two, a five is two. It's two. Okay, I can count six. Okay. But it's one, it's one command, but give the and, and the cattle. That's fine. Is but God I, but, talking in poetry or in prose? In other words, is he giving exact commandments? So then there's stuff missing. He should say, and stand two feet, three inches in front of the cellar. So, but he's giving some, take the stick, but he's not saying talk at a 90 degree angle, do it at exactly two o'clock in the afternoon. Is this poetry or is this prose? I mean, I mean it's not pretty, it's not an art scroll guide to how, how, of how to fulfill hitting the rock. I agree we don't get into the detail of that resolution, but still they're commands, aren't they? Oh, for the- He speak to the rock, it will give water. And then, but how is he supposed to fulfill, take water it's out of the rock? It's not a command, it's an assignment. Okay, but, but it's, it's an it's imperative a, form, isn't it? No, but right. it's, it's a narrative. It's a narrative, and, and basically it's just saying what would happen if he talks to the rock. Yeah, but you're forced to say that because there's nothing for him to do. And that's why I ask you to count the commands, because in, in, in grammar, this is a command. This is imperative. Just like these. Every every line here is a command, isn't it? Ka, no, hakel, dibartem, no, lotseita, no, bishkita. Well, that, that's the command for both of them, Botseita, is for you. Dibartem is for Dibartem is you and Aaron. Botseita is just you, Moshe. Botseita would mean that that he that he that you will have put water out of the rock. Put it this way: if there was no command number three, let's say command number three wasn't there, what would command number four? What would what would Moshe do for command number four? Get the water say, gather the nation and take water out of the rock. What would Moshe do? In light of command number one, considering that forty, I mean, 
considering back in Sefer Shemot, he, God told him last time to use his matet hit the rock. So if God said, take, take your staff, gather the nation, and take water out of the rock. If I didn't have this one, but let's take here. Let's get, let's do something for the fun of it. Let's um, let's do this here. Let's let's cut out cut out command number three. Already, if I cut out command number three, and get if the command was take the mate, gather the nation, take water out of the rock. If I skip three, then Moshe just take the staff, hit the rock, and everything's fine. Command number three is superfluous. Now, if command number three is there, okay, if, if command number three is correct, and I take out command number four, it's also fine. Gather the nation, speak to the rock, we'll give water, and then give them to drink. I don't need command number four. Three and four, I'm saying one of, one of the two are superfluous. That's all. So keep that in mind. Already? Why wouldn't the whole that really should be the Totsi? The Totsi Lahem. If it's That's a command, right. I, I agree with you. So therefore, oh, you say what, why? No, but the bartem, but totsi. Right. So if it if, if it's oh, well, say the best you have given. Okay, that's why some translations give it that way. But let me show you how most understood the command. I hear what you're saying. But still, but say that is still a command form. Now, let's let's um let's take a look at what Moshe does already, because it matches perfectly. Let's go back to um, I'm sorry beforehand. Let me get rid of my mouse. Let me back to my mouse and clear the screen and go back to what we do for each command. We took between three and four. And uh, what's the reason for the mate? If, if, if Moshe is supposed to be, why is God telling him to take a mate in the first place? He's not supposed to use it. Now, just a review for those who don't remember. Before we, well, before we got to our Sinai, on the way to our Sinai, after, after Kriyat Yamsuf in Rafidim, after the month story, when Amiso got to Rafidim, remember there was no water to drink. The people complained to Moshe Rabbeinu, what are we going to drink? And Moshe says, don't, don't you trust God? Why are you testing God? And God's, and then uh, they still, there's no, no water. And then Moshe, and they complained again to Moshe. And Moshe turns to the people. I mean, and the people complain to Moshe and say, why take us out of Egypt to kill us? The people are really angry with God. Saw that complaint over and over again. They think they're in a death march. Now Moshe cries out to God and says, what can I do? They're going to kill me. They're going to stone me. Give me a solution. And God gives a solution. Take some elders with you. And the mate, which you hit the Nile River with, remember the old source of water is the Nile River. Take your mate that you used to turn the Nile River into, into blood and walk and go to the, to the rock in Chorev Hit the rock and water will come out. And that was a great miracle back then. So based on this precedent, it's logical for Moshe to think that he should use the staff again. It worked last time. So now, if, if God told everyone, if, if God told the entire nation, Moshe Rabbeinu, talk to them and don't use your staff. Just talk and say. Then if he talked, and, if, he, if he hit instead of talking, I can understand that might be a chilo Hashem or something. But the people don't know what Moshe, what God told Moshe Rabbeinu. There's no Chumash yet. Why is it from, if it was a miracle back in Parsha, I'm not saying 40 years ago, because we're not sure when it happened, when this one's happening. But if it was a miracle in Rafidim, got it? And it sanctified God, and it proved the point. Why can't, Why would you think a mate, why would be any less of a miracle now? I know people want to say 40 years ago, when the kid's growing up, when you're young, you have to give him smack him, and when he's older, you use Dibor, we go from mate to Dibor. Like you're growing up, maturing. That, that that might be a true point, but it doesn't make sense that that would be a sin. Now, so let's. I want to match up now every commander in execution because it matches like a charm, and we get to play with all of our little toys here. Okay, let's take a look at this one. We have a drawing tool. Here we go, and we want. Okay, here. God says, "Kachat What does Moshe do? Like kach Moshe tamatev if Hashem kasher tivo. That for sure is fine, right? See the verb kach veikach. Hakela teida. What do they do? Veyakilu Moshe v'Aron et Hakal apnei Asela. Perfect match, right? Good for two. Look at three. Speak to the rock to give water. Moshe speaks. Then instead of speaking to the rock, what does he do? Says v'dibar tem. Says vayomer. Instead of speaking to the rock, he speaks to the people. 
and calls them not teachers. He calls them rebellious. He calls it rebels or rebellious people. Shimon Amorim, right? And he starts questioning. Do you think we can take water out of the rock? That seems to be a mistake, right? He's supposed to speak to the rock. Instead, he speaks to the people. And then, but what's God say? But say to them, I mean, a seller. What does Moshe do? Vayera Moshe et Yadom. Vayachta b'mateo b'mayim. Listen. Vayitzu mayim rabim. That's perfect, isn't it? Otseita. It worked, didn't it? God said, take water out of the rock. And Moshe takes water out of the rock. Remember, Moshe does an action and water comes out. So Moshe fulfilled number four perfectly. And it makes sense to use this as my tech because it worked 40 years ago. It worked back in and back in Rafidim. Why wouldn't why wouldn't it be good now? Especially if it's if it wasn't 40 years ago, maybe it'd been four or five years ago, depending on when the story happened. Okay. And Bishkita, and again, I don't think you're supposed to pour a cup of water for everybody. He allowed the people to drink the water. Now, if four is correct, the only problem is three. But listen to the logic. Let's let's give Moshe Rabbeinu the, the benefit of the doubt. Let's clear these for a minute. Let's assume that Moshe Rabbeinu is a tzaddik. He's like he's Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay. How did Moshe understand command number three? Okay. What did Moshe do? Moshe spoke. It's, hi, let, let me get a different drawing here. Moshe speaks to the people, right? About the rock giving water, correct? So if Moshe speaks to the people about, I speak on behalf of Aaron as well, remember? Look, see, that's plural, right? Moshe speaks to the people on behalf of himself and Aaron, in plural, and says, What? Do you think we can take water out of the rock? Basically, rewrite command number three to how Moshe understood it. It's as simple as can be, isn't it? Right? All you have to do is change the word L to Al. Al Hasela. Right? What did Moshe understand? Speak about the rock giving water in front of the people and about, give, about it giving water. If I just change the L to Al, it makes perfect sense. I think Ramban brings five examples, at least some examples, of L and Tanakh meaning Al. And there's many. Sometimes, in, in, in a nutshell, when you speak to an object that doesn't have ears, then it means speaking about it. I'll show you. I'll, I'll give you the example he brings from Miriam just to, to show you one example, because um, it's a nice has to do with the korban a little bit. Clear drawing, but let me stop my share. I'm going to open up a Yirmiyot. I think it's Yirmiyot Perak of Zion. Give me a second. Um, Yirmiyot, Yirmiyot. Share screen. Post attendees. Let's open up Yirmiyot Perak of Zion. See if I remember. Yirmiyot 27. Okay. He's talking about. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Here, yeah. Kicho Marashem, Pasakitet. Yeah. Kicho Marashem, Tzvot, El Ha'amudim, Ba'al Hayam, Ba'al Machonot, the Yetar Kilim. Okay. This is the word of God to the Poles, the Amudim. Okay. And the Am, all the different parts of the Beit, all the vessels of Beit HaMikdash. Okay. Asher Lodach, the things that the didn't take yet. Remember, this is between between Galut Yolachin and Galut um, Tidkiel. This is during 11 years after the Babylonians put the first wave of exile before the temple was destroyed. And the people are hoping that, that the king's coming back and things will be better again. And Yermiel is saying no. We, we can, we'll discuss this a lot when we do Yermiel over the next couple of weeks. But God's saying that the Amudim, right? And you have all these different parts of the Beit HaMikdash that weren't taken out of Jerusalem yet. They're all going to go into exile as well. Remember, Bavel Bavel, um, that's a famous line that the Gemara quotes in the end of Ksubas about not making Aliyah. But in a nutshell, what's it say here? El here means Al, doesn't it? El and then Alayam, etc. Because he's talking about the Amudim, about the pillars, and not just to the pillars. So this is one of the many proofs that Elk sometimes can mean Al. So if I go back to to our source, and look at it carefully. How did Moshe understand this command? He didn't misunderstand the command. That's what it means in Hebrew. Now, it means what? Speak to the people about the rock giving water. Now, if you've ever been to a magic show, the magicians sometimes say, do you think I can pull a rabbit out of my hat? He's not questioning whether he can do it. He's making 
asking the miracle greater, isn't he? If, if you question the, the, when you're doing a magic trick, you say, do you think, you know, nothing up my sleeve, do you think I can pull a rabbit out of my head or something like that? And then you do it, that makes the magic trick even better. So to prepare the people for the miracle of taking water out of the rock, right? He says, he, 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 he tells the people, do you think we can take water out of the rock? But it makes sense. Now, why does it make sense what he's saying? If command number four is really a command, which he fulfills, and God told him to take a mate, then how did Moshe understand command number three so it wouldn't be superfluous? Before you do the miracle, prepare them for the miracle and tell the people, pay attention, everybody. Do you think we can take water out of the rock? Because we are going to take water out of the rock. Now, someone mentioned beforehand, and this Ramban says, what was the sin here? He should have said, do you think God can take water out of the rock? Instead of not seeing, said we. Uh, me and Aaron. But on the other hand, God told Moshe, um, the plural speak, you and Aaron, remember? Moshe and Aaron gather people, and both of you speak about the rock giving water. So he's speaking on behalf of both of them. That's why Ebenezer disagrees with Rabbeinu Hanano, who Ramban supports. But we'll get to this one later on. What I'm getting at, if I want, if I want to be a, a um, defense attorney for Moshe Rabbeinu, one is fine, two is fine, three makes sense now. Because once you understand that four is to, is to take water out of the rock and to use the mate to do it, then it makes sense that command number three is not taking water out of the rock, but speaking about the rock giving water. And that's what he does. Now, if that's true, then I have a new problem. Moshe did nothing wrong. Got that? So if, if he was supposed to speak to the rock, like Rashi holds in the Midrash that Rashi quotes, then that was a sin. But if you follow this logic we just did, like all the other partial names do, then there's nothing wrong with three. He did the right thing. He was supposed to speak to the people about the rock giving water. He was supposed to hit the rock. Therefore, all the other parshanim come through the psukim looking for something else he did wrong. One and two for sure are fine. What might be here? The famous Rambam, Shimon Ahamorim. He calls them rebels. Right? And he says, and Ramban in Shimon Prakim, in his introduction to Perki Avot, he talks about how you have to follow the golden path, the middle road. But when it comes to anger, from Maimonides is livid against people getting angry. So he, uh, what do you call it? He says, what was Moshe's big sin? He got angry at the people. Called them rebellious people. And and that's that was his big sin. Ramban, you know, Nachmanides totally disagrees with Rambam, says that can't be. Leaders sometimes have to at least pretend to be angry. That can't be the problem. Okay. Um, so some people say that's the Rambam. Rabbeinu Hanano, and that's the approach that um, that um, that um, Ramban is going to support. Ramban also questions, you know, all the other explanations, and he doesn't like any of them. But he says the best ones were Rabbeinu Hanano, where they sort of said, "Do you think God can take water out of the rock?" That they misworded their statement, and they could have they, because they don't sanctify. They could have sanctified God instead of sanctifying themselves. Do you think we can take water out of the rock? Instead of saying we, they should have said, do you think God can take water out of the rock? And that was a big, terrible sin. Of course, Ebenezer totally disagrees because he's supposed to speak on behalf of himself and Aaron. And they know that Moshe and Aaron represent God. Um, uh, Ebenezer brings all the possibilities, doesn't like any of them. He says the only problem you can find is in four, where he's supposed to hit the rock, but he hits it twice. And by hitting it twice, right, that was his big sin. Of course, Ramban doesn't like that at all. What do you mean? Hitting it twice. First of all, it worked. And that's such a terrible thing. Basically, every Parshan agrees that all the other Parshanim are wrong. And everyone's fishing for something that he did. But no, the questions are always bigger than the answers. Okay? So that's what I want. I want to summarize the reason for all the opinions. But what all the Parshanim did, they don't share this with you. I'm just sharing with you what I call the objective analysis. When you count the commands that Moshe gives and compare the commands to his execution, it matches to the T. That's why I'm, I'm emphasizing in the beginning that there's five commands because there's five actions that Moshe does that relate to these five commands. And Moshe seems to understand the command. And it's hard to find anything he does wrong. And therefore, we have to look for a different problem. Now, the solution begins with the punishment. Okay, so we focus on Moshe. Let's look at the punishment. Everyone said, what was his punishment? Moshe can't go to Israel. Look carefully. I'm sorry. Sorry here. Here's the punishment. Okay. We'll return to that word later. It doesn't mean, believe me, it doesn't mean to believe. Because Moshe and Aaron believe in God. We'll see, it means to trust. 
you didn't trust me or you didn't support me. Support is probably better. You didn't support me. We'll, bring, we'll prove that emunah can mean support sometimes. You didn't support me in public to sanctify me in the eyes of the people. Therefore, you and Aaron can't lead the people into the land that I promised them. What's that mean? God's not saying you can't enter Israel. It's not a sin on a personal level. Okay? It's a leadership problem. And God's telling Moshe, Moshe and Aaron, you've lost your leadership here. And therefore, this has to be a leadership issue and not a, and not a sin. There's got to be something here with leadership. Now, I could look at all the things. Let me stop this here for a minute. Okay? I could look at all the different answers that all the Parshanim gave and not see them as reasons, but signs. Right? When leadership is failing, you start losing it, right? In Hebrew, it's called Siban Siman. Right? What are Simanim? What are signs that he's losing his leadership, getting angry? Like the Rambam, like Rambam said, losing his temper. That's a sign of losing leadership. Miswording to the people how you represent God. That's not a sin, but it's a leadership problem. Hitting it twice, remember? Instead of once. That, that's showing that all these things show that Moshe is agitated and losing it. Again, that's not, those aren't reasons for, for, that's not a sin and a punishment, but those are indicators that there's a leadership problem, that he's losing it. And we saw already, remember in Parsha Palotcha, Moshe did, you know, is fed up with the people. And when people are like, don't like their job, that's how they act sometimes. So it could be. So it could be that these are all signs of a leadership issue, but the main thing God's saying this is a leadership problem. But I think I, I want to go to that leadership because that's our whole theme of the, of the um, but I want to get, I want to do something which I think is really important. We began our, our study of the topic from, from verse seven. We have to go back to verse one when the chapter began and see what's the context of the story. And here's where we're going to see the leadership problem. What I want to claim is there's absolutely nothing wrong in the commands and executions that Moshe does. Because Moshe does exactly what he's supposed to do. That's what Abarbanel says. Abarbanel goes through and pretty much does like what we did. I'm not sure that's what someone told me. But Abarbanel claims he did nothing wrong. If you have time to read it, check it out. See if, see if it's true what I heard. But he claims that Moshe's sin is sending the spies. Got it? And God didn't want to punish him with the spies, so he saved the punishment for later. It's like really, really strange. But he's basing it on his commentary on Sefer Dvarim in chapter one in Dvarim because Moshe says, Gambit in Afashem. After the story of the spies, he tells him, God got angry at me at that time as well. Is he referring to the sin of the spies or maybe this story? Unclear. But he wants to claim that God decided after Chetam Raglim, that's it. And this is only an excuse and not the reason. But it doesn't read that way, though. It's, it's difficult to take that of our Benel. What I want to do, I want to claim the problem is in the beginning of the chapter in the previous scheme. Let's take a look. Let's go back to share my screen and our source sheet. And okay, we talk about the topic of leadership. Remember, now leadership has been an issue remember, ever since Parsha Baloka, right? When Moshe, I mean, ever since the burning bush, Moshe doesn't want to take the job. Almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. But over and over again, Moshe sort of had it with the people. It's called burnout and it's understandable. Now, look how the story begins. In the first verse, there's something strange. Which we have a date, but without a year. Okay? I, I'm going to leave it on the topic of Miriam's death, which is interesting here. I want to focus on the first month. We, we arrive in Midbartzin. Later, be, this will be called Kadesh Midbartzin. According to Chazal, we're there for 19 years. But... Um, I'm not sure when they arrived there, but we arrive. I mean, Rashi says they arrive in the 40th year. But I, it's possible to understand in the end of chapter one in Sefer Bamin Bar, but they should be Kadesh Min Rabim. It might be Kadesh Min Bar Sim, but that's a topic a share in itself. What's important here is Chumash tells us the month and not the year. We arrive in the first month. That detail is critical for the story. Why? When, when, no matter what year it was, What's important, it's the first month. It's the month of Nisan at the end of the rainy season. There's no water to drink. Now, if you've been to Midbar Tzin, if you've been to Nachal Tzin, it's the biggest uh, valley, the biggest valley that cuts from west to east through the, um, through, through this, through the, through the Negev. If you know um, ben where Ben-Gurion's uh, buried in, um, where's this Ben-Gurion is in Stable Care. 
There's a big nachal right below stable care called nachotzin. It's massive. And when it rains up in Hare uh, Hebron, the water comes down or in the Negev, nachotzin is flooded. This place called Enat Cave. There's lots of great tuli in there. Um, there's, there's lots of water in Midbar Tzin, and there's lots of water in the aquifer under, underneath the ground in Midbar Tzin. And Midbar Tzin, if you dig deep enough, you can catch water. So the assumption is they're in Midbar Tzin. There's water like in an aquifer underground, but the aquifer is dry already in the first month, which means there's no hope for another six, seven months for, for rain. That's, the fact that the aquifer is already dry in the first month, and there's not that very little chance of rain coming, the people are assuming they're all going to die of, of thirst, which is a very logical conclusion. Got it? There's no water to drink, and there's no hope that maybe next week or two weeks they'll start raining again. And therefore, what's the assumption? We're all going to die of thirst, which would be a slow and, and uh, you know, terrible death. No. What have the people been complaining ever since they left Egypt? Remember, they think they're in a death march. We saw that before Kriyat Yamsuf. We saw that before the Man, before Rufidim. We saw that um, in, um, in the story of the spies. We saw we relate to that in the story of, of the of the Slav. God's just setting them up to die all the time. We read last week in Korach, Atem Amitam. God's just killing people. These people want to bring Karbonot, and they all get killed. The two fifty, remember? And this is what they say now. The people complained to Moshe, quarrel with him. I went already to this directly to, to Parshat Korach. Why? Who died Lifne Hashem? Lifne Hashem means in front of God. That's the 250 people who brought the Torah. Those 250 did not know that their lives were on the line. Moshe told them, you want to bring Karbano? Give it a try. They didn't know if, if you lose, you're dead. Moshe said, you want to bring carbon up, give it a try and see what happens. See if God accepts your carbon. He didn't say that if, you, if you're wrong, you're going to die. But what happened instead? They all died. They weren't expecting to die, and they died in, in, in an instant. And this is what they're saying now. The people are being harsh. What are they saying? We would have been better off had we rebelled against you with Korach, because the 250 and all the complainers, they died instantly. And if you... Assuming we're all going to die anyhow, as we'll say in the next line, it's better, it's quick, not expected, you know, and painless, as opposed to dying slowly from thirst and watching everyone else die at the same time. So they're saying, we should have died with our brethren in front of God, meaning in, in the rebellion of Korah. We'll see how this relates to Korah soon. But lama veitem et kal Hashem elimit barzeh lamut sham anachum Why would you bring us out here to die again? You see, again, there's came the same complaint. They think they're on a death march. And they're complaining to Moshe Rabbeinu, we would have been better off had we rebelled against you. At least that you just want us all dead. And now they continue. Why did you bring text out? Why did you bring this, this bad place? Everything you promised us, you didn't give us. Those, the people are still assuming they're on a death march, and that's what they see. Especially after Chetam Raglim, it makes a lot of sense. Now, Listen to what Moshe says in response. Okay? In other words, the people, they're complaining to Moshe and Aaron, but they're complaining, I think, they're complaining about God to Moshe and Aaron. Because Moshe and Aaron represent God. Remember, the first time they complained about the, by the man, remember? Um, God has to prove to people, don't complain, it's not Moshe and Aaron, it's me. Remember, remember the story back in chapter 16 in Shemot. To our surprise, Moshe and Aaron do not respond. If I go back to chapter 17 in Shmot, go back there to chapter 17 in Shmot. Um, here we go. That was back, back, you know, back in Rafidim. They throw travel, but, but in, there's no water to drink. They complain to Moshe and say, give us water to drink. Moshe tells the people, he responds to them. It says, don't, 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 don't Argue with me, don't test God. He says, God will take care. And they're more thirsty. And then Moshe turns and they complain again. And the Moshe is active. Okay? He cries out to God in prayer, complains to God and says, give me a solution for the people. And God gives him a solution. But Moshe is very proactive in that story. And he's supporting the people and arguing with God on behalf of the people. And God gives him a solution. 
Here in our story, what happens? People complain in a very similar manner. Let's take a look carefully again. People complain. But after they complain, instead of responding to the people, saying anything, again, they fall on their face. They don't, there's, there's a crisis. And God's credibility is in question. And instead of support, what I want to claim here, Moshe and Aaron should be supporting God in this crisis. The people are complaining about God in this situation. Moshe should say, have faith in God, have trust in God, who'll take care of us, whatever's necessary. But what Moshe is saying, but Moshe in our own and our own, remember the complaint to both of them, instead of standing up for God and supporting God, right, they run away from the group. And when all the people are complaining about, about God and the leadership that's supposed to represent God and support God doesn't say anything. Instead, they run away from the complaints and run away to the Illinois and fall on their faces. That's, that's not a sin. That's a leadership issue. Okay? Now, Moshe and I have every reason to give up. How many times have to prove to the people? But it, it's a tragic situation, but basically Moshe and Aaron don't know, can't handle the people. They don't know what to deal with, with, the, with the complaints. Now, God's going to give them a solution. What's, what's, um, what's God's solution going to be? God's going to tell Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, like we saw before. Remember? All the different things to do. You know, take, God gives Moshe Rabbeinu. Know, what I want to claim is, what God is telling Moshe to do, he should have done on his own. And let me prove that now real quickly. From the end of Parsha Korah. Remember, what I want to claim is, a second, let me stop this here for a second. What I want to claim is that from a leadership point of view, coming out of Egypt, you know, the first, the first year or so, God's doing everything for them. But there's a certain point where leadership has to work from the bottom up. We're about to go to Israel and become a nation. Um, the example I'd like to give is in a, in a school. If there's a teacher, substitute teacher, teacher, a regular teacher, and every time the students complain, he sends them to the principal's office. Okay? If the teacher can't handle the class, and every time someone starts up in class and this complaint, he sends the kids to the principal's office, the principal can't throw the kids out of school, they're paying full tuition. He has to get rid of the teacher. I hope you got my point clear. Meaning the job of the teacher, you can't run to the principal every two minutes with, with the class issue. And if every single time there's an issue, and a leadership problem in Sefer Bamidbar, Moshe and Aaron fall on their face and turn to God instead of solving it themselves, it's tragic. But Moshe and Aaron are unable to deal with the people. And what, what God basically was telling them in this story, like what happened here, you and Aaron, we have to why is Aaron being punished as well? Not punished. How come both Moshe and Aaron lose their leadership? It's this story. It's, God is showing them, here's why you and Aaron can't leave them. Why? Yando and Mantambi. Let's look at what they say here. I want to claim is the, the first thing God does is let's solve the problem, give them water. But you didn't support me. The, the, the leadership problem is in the first five sukim, the first six sukim, where instead of dealing with the problem and supporting God, they don't support God in public. Yando and Mantambi, you didn't trust me. You didn't support me in front of my neighbor in Israel, like Dishani, to sanctify me. Therefore, you and Aaron can't lead them in. It's not a one time offense, it's not a one time mistake. It's been that way since since Parsha Balotcha, when Moshe says, "I'd rather you know, when when Moshe throws in the towel," and it's understandable why why they why they're giving up. Before God tells Moshe and Aaron what their what their what the consequence, it's not a punishment, it's a consequence. Before he's got to solve the problem. Now, what I want to claim is, if I go back to the end of Parsha Korach, um, if I go back to the end of Parsha Korach. Look at the solution that God gave them after Korah. Let's share my screen again and go back to what we read yesterday in Israel and next week in America. Here we go in Parsha Korah. Everyone knows the main story. I'm missing something here. One second. Oh, here we go. Um, let's go to Parsha Korah in chapter 17. Here we are. Chapter 17, okay. okay with, uh, by, by the word emunah means to support. I should have brought these examples. Um, emunah, again, doesn't always mean to believe. It means to support. The best example in Moshe's hands were heavy. 
they book an, an Eben, remember, uh, fighting Amalek, and he has to hold his hands up. And all of them hands were supported until the evening. Or in Megat Tevayi Omeina Tadasa, he supported Tadasa. The word Amein Davening means I agree, I support. Amein doesn't mean I believe. Amein Davening means I agree. When the Chazan makes a blessing, the people say we agree with that statement that Hashem is Magen Abraham and He's Machayim Mitim and He's Hakadosh. So when you say Amein to Brachim, means I support that. Like we used to say in the '60s, right on. I, I agree with that 100. Um, percent a, a pillar is called an Omna. In a minute, a wet nurse takes care of a baby, supports the baby, brings it up. Um, so the other man, this doesn't mean they don't believe in God. Of course they believe in God. They don't support God publicly in the eyes of the people. And that problem of not being supportive of God is more evident in the first six who came than in the story in, in the than in the story later on when they take one out of the rock. Now, if we go to Parshat Korach. After the whole Korach incident, Moshe does everything to try to, you know, get his point. What happens the next day? You set them up. Right? You told them to bring the Torah, remember? The 250. What do they want? They want to say everyone's Kadosh. You told them to bring Torah, right? And they died. You killed them. You set them up. Okay. So again, God has to come and save them again. So Moshe does something very nice here. He tells Aaron to take the Torah, and that proves the Torah saves the people. But when it's over, we'll, we'll skip the whole story. When it's over, God says as follows. By that Hashem Moshe Lemor. God wants to put an end to the complaints. Tell B'nai Israel that every leader of every, every tribe take a, a staff. Remember? And write the names of all the tribes on the, on the, on the staffs. Okay? Leave the staffs in the tent of meeting overnight. Okay. <clears throat> Listen carefully. The tribe that I'll choose, so that I'll choose, his staff will blossom. And listen carefully now. This will put an end. Oh, here we'll see the English. I will make cease for me these murmurings of the children of Israel. God's saying, I want to put an end to all the complaints. I'm going to give you a tool. God does Moshe Rabbeinu. Don't come running to me the next time there's a complaint. I'm going to give you a tool to show them the next time they complain to make to make your point clear. Okay. So Moshe tells the leaders to do as God said. Everyone brings their mate. And look at the end of the story. Okay. Okay. Moshe takes them out. He shows them to everybody. And of course, Aaron's Mateh wins. Now, we didn't get our, our solution yet. Here's the, big, here's the big line. Here's our solution. God tells Moshe, Take Aaron's Mateh, Aaron's Mateh, the one that won the contest, return it where? To the Oamoid. If they do it, it's in the old way, in front of the Ark of the Testimony. Let me smear it for safekeeping. As a sign for rebellious people. Remember, they marry are rebellious people. And this will put an end to the complaints. Now, what good is Aaron's Mateh that won the contest doing if it's in the old if they do it? It's to be it's for safekeeping. What's this imply? The next time the people complain, what does Moshe need to do? To go to the Omai, take the Mateb Aaron, and show it to the people. And tell them, remind them that they're rebellious. Notice, Hashemit Mateh Aaron, if they do, the Mishmer, if they marry. It's a sign for B'nai Mary. And this will put an end to the complaints. They ask Moshe Kashir, see if Hashem can say, put the Mateh back in the, in the Oamoid. Now, therefore, the next time Amisro complains, let me stop this here for a second. What needs to happen the next time I'm, the people complain? The next time the people complain, instead of running to God, what should Moshe and Aaron do? Take the Mateva Aaron and the Oamoid, take it out, and show it to the people and remind them that they're rebellious. Uh, now, guess what the next story in Chumash is? What's the next narrative? This is the very end of Parshat Korach, right? Well, that was chapter 17. Chapter 18 is the narrative, is the law section. Matnot Kuna. 
chapter 18, chapter 19, is Paraduma, a law section. The next narrative in Klimish is chapter 20. Okay. And it's and what do these people say? Remember, blue gavanu Hashem. It's right after the Korach incident. So uh, there's no doubt that this is tied to the Korach incident. And therefore, the next time the people complain is that it's in Parshat Chuka. We don't know how many months in between, but it seems okay. soon after. And what happens? The people complain. What should Moshe do? Based on what God told him, when they complain, instead of running away from the people, Moshe should take in the Mateh of Aaron, showed it to the people, reminded that they're rebellious, got it? And, and solve the problem. Now, Moshe knows how to get water out of the rock. He did it before. And basically, what does God tell Moshe to do? What he should have done on his own. And that's, again, the leadership problem. We talked about You can't run to God every time there's a little problem. <coughs> God gave you a tool to solve it. <coughs> so let's take a look now at the end of the story of what happens. I'm saying, let's go back now. What happened? After all those events, what is God, okay, read it right here. What does God tell Moshe to do? Remember, after Moshe and Aaron fall on their face, God tells, Kachet Hamate. God didn't say, take your staff, take the staff. Now Moshe understands what Moshe, what does Moshe do? It's not Moshe's staff that he takes, it's Aaron's staff. And God says, Moshe, I, mean, I told you, and Parshat Korach, I told you the, the last chapter, we don't know how many, how many months are in between, but I gave you a solution for the complaints. Take the Matev Aron, which is our living Mary, and, and rebuke them and lead them. Right? And God tells Moshe, you know, take the staff that I gave you. Gather the nation together with Aaron. Why? And speak about the rocky being water and give them water. You know what to do. But my, my claim is, there's nothing wrong here at all. The only problem here is God had to tell Moshe what he should have done on his own. That's what I want to claim. And what's the proof? Etamatem lifnei Hashem kasher tzivau is referring to, not kasher tzivau here, as he commanded back to Parshat Korach. Prisha Chizkun here, or, yeah, Chizkun and Prisha brings this possibility. That the mate here is matev Aron. It's not matecha, it's hamate. Lifnei Hashem, that's got, this has to be Aron's mate that won the, that won the contest. There's no doubt. It, this mate is Aaron's mate, which is Mithne Hashem, which is from Parshat Korach. And Kasher Tzivo is referring to you, not here, but back in Parshat Korach. The problem is God had a reminder to take it. And therefore, and gather the nation together. Tell them, and the Moshe understands now, if it's not Lifne Mary, he tells them Shimon HaMorim. So it makes sense that he tells them Shimon HaMorim. Okay. Do you think we can get water out of the rock? And take what he takes water out of the rock. The problem is God had to tell him what to do and he should have done it on his own. But what I'm getting at is that my claim is, and my time is up, is that the, the main topic here is a leadership issue. And what it could be, I want to sort of take what Barbara now said for, on, in a different way. It, once Moshe, once the, the story, the story of, um, if I want to summarize everything we did, the story in Balotcha, when Moshe gives up, I don't want to leave them anymore. I can't handle their complaints. There's no doubt that there's a leadership issue. And that was the Midrash where, where um, Eldad and my dad are saying, Moshe and Aaron are going to die and, and Yeshua is going to lead them in. There's already indicating that story. There's already a leadership problem. It started back at the burning bush. In Parshat, in Parshat Shlach, Moshe and Aaron fall on their face again. And Yeshua and Caleb take leadership. In Korach, first Moshe falls on his face and God has to give him a solution again afterwards. But we see, we see from Pasha Korach, the people don't, Moshe, again, Moshe doesn't trust the people, the people don't trust him. There's that lack of trust between the people and Moshe Rabbeinu. It's just not working. Now, Moshe has every reason to give up on them. He tried so hard and it, it failed. But that's exactly the tragedy of Sefer Bamidbar. Moshe doesn't trust the people. We talked about this at the beginning, and the people don't trust Moshe Rabbeinu. That's not a sin, it's just a tragedy. And this story is simply an indicator again that it's not working. And I think what God's telling Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moshe Rabbeinu fall on the, an arm fall on their face, God says, here's what you need to do, but they should have done it on their own. And when it's over, God tells Moshe, you know what? Here's another example. Yama right? You didn't support me again to sanctify me. 
therefore you can't bring them in. It's just not working. Moshe and Aaron's leadership is not working. And what's the, it doesn't work. Definitely for, with, the, with, the, with the first generation, it didn't work. Now with the new generation, once he's 120, as someone mentioned in the beginning, it's already too late. So he leads them, you know, against, um, you know, with Sichon and Oak, et cetera. But it's time you need leadership that knows how to deal with the people and can sanctify God in a in a day-to-day -day basis. That my, my point is Moshe doesn't sin. It says Moshe basically is unable to deliver God's message to the nation, not because he's did anything wrong, but there's this lack of compatibility between Moshe and the people. Their level is so low and so basic that they need a different type of leadership to bring them back. So that's what I want to end with. Um, um, again, again, my, my whole point is that Moshe Rabbeinu, of course, doesn't sin. How could he sin? It's not Shogir Macy. He doesn't sin at all. It's just there's a tragedy in Sefer Devarim of leadership where you have a leader way greater than the people. And that's a tragedy many times in Jewish history that we have people who are, we have great leaders sometimes who people don't appreciate. And um, and only sometimes in hindsight, we realize how great they were. So we'll, I'll take questions real fast, but that's why I wanted to conclude the series with is that Sefer Bambir is basically a tragedy. That's what we saw in Tilim. The, 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 door, the door wasn't ready. But Moshe Rabbeinu was such a high level, he wasn't able to relate to them. He needed teachers. And everyone running a school, if you know uh, nowadays in education, every principal wants uh, a young teacher who can talk to the kids, relate to the kids, can play ball with the kids. To, you, know, you can't take some old Rebbe who's you know big Talmud Chacham. He's not going to connect high school kids. We need someone who's more down to earth. And that doesn't mean that uh, you know a 40, 50 year old Talmud Chacham Rebbe is not, it's not good, but he's it's not what kids on a low level need. So you know, depending on what super you're dealing with, you need leadership that's fitting for the level of the people. And Moshe Rabbeinu was, I guess, overqualified for the job. Moshe Naro. Okay, let's take a look at the chat real fast. I know there's a lot, and I've got to go in a minute. We're over time, but I'll look at the chat real quick. Wait, chat, chat, chat. Go. Okay, let's work backwards. Let's go to the beginning. Oh, it's going to take a long time. Oh, I'm going to share this source sheet again. There. There's a source sheet for those who want it. I'll send the link again. That's a source sheet. Okay, because it wasn't on the Rabbi Jay's in um on away this week, and so is Maxine. So I was able to send it to them to post it, but that was a link to it. Let's go back to the beginning. No sound. I'm just gonna read the comments real fast, make it bigger. Okay. Um okay. Uh okay, we talked about showcase. We can skip the first part. Check. Did I miss something? Okay, we've got the numbers five and six. Okay. Um, okay, maybe before we talked about Shimon Orim. Okay. Okay. Okay, the source that I just sent out, the mismatch. Okay, very good. Um, okay, the Red Sea, the people believed in Hashem and Moshe. It lasted for a day. Yeah. Now the Midbar could no longer believe that. I don't think it can. Um, Edmund wrote that the people believe in Moshe. Again, I don't think it's belief. I think it's trust. So sometimes you trust your leaders. I, I don't want to be political, but um, you just bring an example from Israeli politics. The second, like, again, with the, I'm not taking sides, good or bad, but the second that people don't trust uh, the prime minister, or be it Bibi, be it Bennett, be it whatever it is, if there's a lack of trust that everything the prime minister is doing, he's doing it for personal reasons. That, that lack of trust is disastrous for a country. It could be the leader is a great person, but when the people don't trust him, it's not good. It's not healthy. Okay, I guess uh, with that political note, without taking sides, just using that as an analogy, we'll stop here. Any other last minute questions? Hope we're okay. Anyway, so next week I'll make the announcement again. We're going to start. We're going to start um, Sefer Yirmiyahu, and it'll take us through Tishba for sure. Maybe even through Elul. Okay. Yeah. Everyone have a good week. I find it very interesting that the mate has such an important way of telling people uh, uh, about God, about Israel. Why? Why dafka the mate? Oh, why the mate? Is it humans need symbols? Symbols are important. Uh, all the makot have a mate, don't they? 
Yes, and Mato. even in the beginning, from uh, Mount Sinai after yeah. Moshe comes first time to Paro, uh, yeah, yeah. the Mate is uh, changed to a. Yeah. Uh, and and, and what, what are the tribal leaders called in Sefer Babidvar? Roshe Hamatot. Matem, Matem. Now, bottom line, the Chazab called the book Chumash Pchudim. If I want to get my key point, everyone's to blame. The people are blaming the leaders instead of taking responsibility. Everyone's pakud. Right? Everyone has to count. Everyone knows that they count. That's why you have to count the people. That's how many people there are. They, everyone knows that they count. And the people are blaming their leaders. And the leaders are blaming the people. Follow? And everyone's blaming Moshe. Moshe is blaming them. Right? And everyone has a point. But that's what's tragic. The, the key is that you need you need to trust your leaders and, tr and the leaders have to trust the people. How to build that trust, that's the big question. With common goals and common understanding. But building trust between people in leadership and people knowing, you know, instead of, there's a way of life where something goes wrong, blame somebody else. Okay? You might be 100% right, but doesn't get you anywhere. Everyone, they, again, I'll go back to Israeli politics. Everyone be 100% right, but you're not going to grow anywhere if you're just blaming your leaders all the time. It's called a right? dan when, when something goes wrong, oh yeah, he's to blame. When your whole attitude is, that's no good, that's no good, that's no good. You, you might be right, but you're not going to build a country that way. You, you need you need people taking taking action, taking leadership. And if someone you don't trust something, okay, then you do it. But don't don't spend your whole time criticizing and and saying what's wrong all the time. Take your time and do something good with it. And with, I think I think that's like a long, uh, you know, a deeper take-home message from the whole story. And, you know, there's always people to blame, but the main if everyone works on themselves. The leadership has to take responsibility. The people have to take responsibility. And uh, and that's something we need again. The word mate again, symbolism is super important all in life. Yeah. But the mate, there's the galim, aren't there? And say for bar. What do people need? Every 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 group. Needs their mascot needs their flag. Needs their. That's human nature. Again, why ask an anthropologist? But that's human nature, isn't it? You know, people. You need a sign. You need a an oath. A tefillin. Remember, oath dacha tzitzit, things like that. They're all signs that you have to see something to remember, and that's human nature. Uh, Eric Durkheim was a big uh, anthropo. I, um, I forgot what his field was, but he talked about symbolism, and it was a big. Uh, like it starts with the child growing up that the security blanket reminds him of his mother. Like that's why he holds on to blanket because he needs his mother, the child. So you need a symbol. Like the child needs a symbol of his mother, even when the mother's not there. Yeah. And humans need symbols. That's why it's, half of the world of its fault works with that. Thank you. Again, why God made us that way, that's a different question. But symbolism is important in everything we do. Thank okay, you. Anyway, everyone have a good week and enjoy it. Hopefully, if you take vacations a little bit, play oh, the good news in this room. And, uh, it's been week. fantastic. Okay. Just, are, are, will we find you again under the same link next week when we start? I'm assuming news? yes, but uh, they'll probably, if there is, I'm, I'm assuming it'll be the same link, but um, we'll Jay will let us vacation. Know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm assuming there will be. It's been fantastic. Okay. Yeah, Rabbi Rachel said. Okay, thank you so much.